Data storytellers, we're picking up where we left off, advanced business communications for data storytellers. I don't even know how many episodes we're in at this stage, um, but uh, we kind of started dissecting for a specific area of the synthesis. So we've been talking about the superordinate, subordinate, actually subordinate is, is the first, uh, yep. superordinate and asynchronous communications in terms of the playbooks. Now we're still at the subordinate and we covered some ground already, but we still have two key areas left, should be impact claims, and discovery. Yes, sir. So because we're starting with impact claims, I will, so that's an area where I will love hearing the nuances of that particular the scenario. Uh, Dave has all the visibility and I will be a captive audience and I will try to add as much as I can to that. Um, and then discovery will be very interesting because I think that's also like one of the most common and I think most consequential and most like those insights from the discovery, I think they're just so applicable across all channels and forms of communication. So, um, so do you want to also maybe provide some additional context here and just maybe introduce the, the impact claim topic? Yeah. So we've been doing, like you said, subordinate scenarios, right? And we identified four with this like fifth one that kind of dangles off the end known as sales, right? So last time we talked about launching something new or trying to get inside of a management process or business process. And those are almost the same problem to differing degrees. Today's where we're talking about impact claim and discovery. These are going to feel like opposites in many ways. The, excuse me, the, the impact claim particularly though, you know, I think I might've said this multiple times so far. This might be the most important episode <laughs> that we're going to cover because while the term impact claim, it may be uh, bringing out certain feelings or people or questions. People, I don't know what he's talking about. He's talking about impact claim. But once we get into it and I make the big reveal, it's like, okay, what, what, what does this guy actually mean? It's going to yank on the heartstrings and some potentially like anxieties <laughs> of exactly who we want to listen to this because it's, it's the hardest part of data science. Like by far, if you think that getting someone to change their behaviors and use your widget is difficult, getting a, a, a finance person or, or a business leader who's trying to manage a PL to acknowledge the value of data science can be even harder than that. Hmm. And so that's my, like, so my intro is like, we're going to do probably the hardest and most unpleasant subordinate <laughs> scenario. And then we're going to mix it with maybe one of the more fun ones especially for people that have haven't lost their you know data science curiosity that kind of got them into the field when they started as they as they, they sort of beat it out of you as you move up the ranks and you become an executive you start to know all the answers instead of ask all the questions but being able to go back into question mode i think does it, it brings you back a little bit and it can be fun so we're going to do the best of times and the worst of times um, and I'm just as robust as Dickens, so maybe we can just jump right in. To <laughs> Fantastic. Try to, try to avoid it. All right. So what do I mean by impact claims? In a organization, and it's going to happen at a certain point in the maturation of the organization and of the data science department, the question's going to come up, what is the point of data science? Okay. And it comes at this interesting time because even now, like in the environment that we're talking, like there's been a lot of tech layoffs, there's been a lot of downsizing. I've, I just did a market check because I was, I'm looking to hire somebody pretty soon and like the wages are down a little bit. And so this is pot potentially even more uh, relevant than it normally is, but pretty much every business needs to either be profitable or at the very least stay in the black if they're a nonprofit, but they're trying to like hit zero or something. And data science is a cost center. Unless you're somehow able to sell the data science, you are a cost center. Okay. If you do data science to drive commercial growth, like what I do, I drive, I, I do data science to drive sales growth. The salespeople bring in the money. I, consume the money. I'm a, I, I'm a cost center. 
And so whether it's the CFO, the CEO, the, even the CADO, CIO, like somebody at some point is going to ask the question, we're spending all this money on data science. What are we getting for it? What's the ROI? What's the impact? And then the data scientists need to say, this is the impact. This is the value that our work, the fruit of our labor, has brought to the company, whether that's increased sales, decreased costs, uh, less turnover, whatever it ultimately, like everybody who does data science is working on different business problems. So you have to be able to say, because I'm here and because you pay me to be here, you are now this much richer as a result of it, whether it's cost avoidance or actual money in the bank. And that is staking your claim, your impact claim. My team created so many million dollars. You're welcome. That's what we're talking about. That's the scenario. So this is fascinating on so many levels because right now what we're uh, uh, looking at and also within the data storytellers community is this whole idea of the data transformation so the data mm -hmm. transformation it's a buzzword that's being thrown around all the time data doing business transformation but it's very real in the sense that everyone is looking to kind of catch up with and get ahead of wherever the industry is going everyone feels like okay it's going a million miles it's going somewhere there are all kinds of pressures in the market, in the business environment in general, because of the economic, it's an interesting economic spot right now. The technology is booming, expanding, like AI is shaking up everything. So in that data transformation, every, everyone is looking to, hey, we gotta make that big leap. We gotta be able to push forward and make things happen, change things. Or at least if, if uh, you're a data uh, uh, analytics leader, who's actually taking his or her job seriously, then you are looking at this uh, very, very closely. And the whole idea of getting ready for that transformation, having the right things in place for that transformation, you know, everything from awareness, a narrative that drives your data transformation, uh, like all that, the, the complementary skills, super important. So um, it brought to mind this event because also there are all these random events that are happening. One of the one of our members is one of the biggest restaurant chains in America. Um, they recently got a new CEO. That was a CEO change, and suddenly they find themselves in the crosshairs of an impact audit. Right? It's like they don't call it an impact audit, but that's what's happening. It's like okay, new CEO. The the guy likes to shake things up. And now there's an atmosphere suddenly when everyone's work is getting scrutinized and looked at. And here's the, you know, it's like you can't fault the CEO. He just joined the company. He needs to understand the exactly. business and what needs to be done. So he has all the mandate, both formal and informal. And now you're in a situation where, hey, I have to have some conversations in which I need to make a very compelling impact. Um, do I have the right idea? about the, the like what no, the impact that's means. exactly what it is i mean like you know here i'm i mean i'm starting the data science team so i have like a much longer runway but like you know at cvs where i used to work it's a for-profit company and again you get this runway because the the data science organization wasn't super old right compared to like hr which has always existed uh so it's a, hey like you guys are consuming a bunch of money What's the impact? What's the so what? Which is another way it gets asked. And so I'm not surprised that there was a CEO chain and the CEO's like, hey, I would love to know basically what is the yield on all of this outflow of cash? And for your friend in the restaurant, the restaurant business, when you look across on a per capita basis, the data science team is probably fairly high in the cost structure meaning you know uh speaking in terms of the american market uh, on, on the northeast you've got entry-level data scientists pulling in six figures and oh, yeah. i know oh, i know yeah. i know lots of people that have been working for 20 years who haven't broke that yet so like they're very expensive resources mm -hmm. and it's very hey, think about that like you can either fire 30 people or five people and you might end up with a equal equal reduction of of cost then maybe that ratio is too too lopsided but like illustratively speaking right like that 
that's another reason why like the eye of Sauron is, is going to be drawn to, to data science when you're doing impact audits. And so that's the scenario. And that, that's very, very, very uncomfortable. And that's why we're going to put so much energy into let's build a playbook to sort of navigate. Now, now you're in combat. So it's like, what's your, it's almost like, what's the battle playbook for this one? I love this because again, having worked with so many of these senior leaders in the past 10 years, we just tell you that we work with most of the FD 500 and it's yep, yep. like during that time when data became huge, sexy, it's like, okay, data is the new oil and all that. And then now on top of it, there's the whole AI thing actually taking, taking off in a very real way. Um, and still like some of these biggest companies and I'm talking, uh, uh Facebook, I'm talking like, even now you can see that there are massive layoffs in some of the biggest companies and incredibly intelligent, capable people find themselves, oh, hey, boom, that was a change, huge changes on the market because all these markets are impacted in very unexpected ways. Think about the restaurant industry. Yeah. In the past five years, did anything unexpected hit the restaurant in the industry? And no, nothing <laughs> in the last five years that would have affected restaurants. <laughs> so po point being is that every single industry is kind of in this, in, in this state, uh, state now. So. Quick question with an impact lane. Yeah. What is, what is the, and maybe this is too much of a leading question, but I don't, uh, I don't know if I can turn it into a fully open ended. No, I can't. When is the best time to build and like be, get prepared for an impact claim? Um, is it so, something that you do after the fact, uh, or is it something that you continually prepare? So it's both, right? And I know that that's a cop-out answer, but I'm going to explain why you need to jump right on top of that fence, right? And sit on top of it. So one of the reasons why data scientists often, they are data science leaders often end up in that predicament where their impact is even questioned is because, and we'll talk a little bit more about this in the, when we talk about discovery, but it costs nothing to ask the data science team to look at something. And through, I don't know if it's like evolution, so to speak, like we tend to have this eager to support, eager to deliver consulting, like a little bit of that, like consulting recipe gets kind of put into the mix. And so we're constantly seeking things, right? And when you think about that cocktail of it costs me nothing to ask you to do something and you want to do things, you cre <laughs> and what ends up happening is you got a full plate and it took you nothing to get there. And, and then this is where it becomes dangerous because you're like, oh, I'm 130% utilized. I'm oversubscribed. Mm. Mm. That means I'm super, I'm indispensable. The business loves me. And then you deliver a bunch of stuff to, you know, the vice president of marketing and vice president of actually owning the PL is like, I didn't ask you to do that. I'm the one who's funding you, bro. <laughs> it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> That's not good for me. Or they fill up your queue and, you know, Today, the most important thing in my life is X. Go build that. Go in the lab and build that. It takes you three months. Come back out three months. I did it. No, oh, that's old news. Today, <laughs> the biggest, so it's like, okay, so you have this like risk of working for the wrong person, working on the wrong problem, and working on the wrong time scale. And so that's all where like prevention is like an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Because you asked me, when do you prepare for it? Well, that's where you need like filters and you need to agree up front. Okay, this is the KPI we're trying to impact. This is the magnitude that we think we can impact it by. Here is the timing. Oh, and is the person who ultimately funds all of this the one who is supportive of this? And looking at my own career, I made a lot of mistakes by getting super extended we we're like 150 percent utilized and like i'm not using that hyperbolically like team was working nights and weekends and, and a lot of like you know 9 p.m meetings and stuff like that to try to keep projects on track for the wrong customer internal mm. customer. and then at the end of the year they're like oh no one asked you for that and i was like no 
that person asked me for that. They're like, did you ask them for that? Yeah, well, I can't cut you any further, so I'm just going to cut this guy because apparently they've got enough energy to do pointless projects. And also, who's, uh, that's a good question. Whose fault is the, is the pointless project? Because the person who's asking you to do it, they don't know about data science. I mean, definitely don't have an, any idea about the realities of, of that work and the real possibilities. They don't, they're not experts in data analytics. They don't have a bunch of data analytics friends. Who, so they don't understand. It's just like, okay, here's a resource. I can use it. I don't know. I mean, no one trained me on how to use this because I'm just going to you know, start firing all over. And then whose fault is it that that resource was wasted in a way? Right. I, I, you know, it's like the, there was this video I saw the other day of like Steve Jobs saying like, it's, 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 a, it's a bad thing. I can't remember if he said tragedy, but where someone thinks that the idea is 90% of the, of the success. I saw that video. I think maybe yeah. Elon Musk posted it on, on X. Maybe, maybe he posted it, but yeah. Maybe. It maybe. maybe. And, Anyways, it's, it's such a classic. It's such a classic. But just as, as an aside, it's funny because a lot of people that I, I, you know, back in like 06, when I started working, like everybody wanted to emulate him and everybody thought he was just an ideas guy. <laughs> yeah. You had all of these like really abrasive ideas guys running around thinking that they were the next Steve Jobs. And I'm like, you do realize that, <laughs> you know, he was a workaholic. He did do a ton of actual hands-on work. A craftsman. You know, that's He's very he famous for his ideas. And like, I know Wozniak probably did the heavier lifting, but like he wasn't just the guy chewing an apple and being like, yes. uh, make it class. <laughs> like that wasn't him. That wasn't what he was. Yeah, he was, he was pretty involved. <laughs> right. He was pretty involved. Right. <laughs> so we're here in this impact plan. And so uh, the, the proactive stuff is you got to agree. This is what we're working on. This is why we're working on it. This is the business outcome. Oh, and we're also going to agree that if it's not on this list, it's not getting done. Because again, it costs nothing to ask. Okay. And the locus of blame, whether it's fair or not, if that's not for us to decide, it gets shifted to the doers and not the requesters. Because it's like, well, you're the $200,000 per year resource and you built the widget 9,000 and no one's using the widget 9,000. So you're a failure. And no one says, who asked you to build the widget 9000? Who told you it was going to be important? Who told you it was going to have an impact? And how did we collectively get to a point where enough people thought the widget 9000 was a good idea and then the widget 9000 was brought into being? And that's the deadly thing is because all these other people have great ideas. Like you said, they don't do data science. They don't do and so they oh, if we only knew the answer to that question then mm -hmm. we, would, we would take all of the market share. You, you're the guy who answers <laughs> questions. Go answer that question for me. So that's where like the proactivity is super important, okay? But also in that proactivity, you can agree on the methodology to measure, mm. okay? Because when you think about measurement, it's very easy to poke holes in anything that's measured. Like you go on to like PubMed or the Canadian equivalent, and you can get any white paper you want. And I'm sure if you read it really hard, really intently, you will find some sort of flaw that you disagree with. Right? Like they might say, or, or, or it could be an analysis of the study. Maybe the study itself was done well, but then someone's trying to make a leap. Like uh, in fitness, they do lots of studies on like sedentary, obese populations. And then they're like, oh, orange juice lowers body fats. Like, well... <laughs> When you're super fat and you don't do anything but drink orange juice, it lowers your total calories and you lose all the weight. So, like, you can't just give it to a bodybuilder and assume they're going to get shredded off of orange juice. But people try to make these, like, weird jumps from one study on one population to another. So the reason I'm saying this is, like, it's very easy to attack methodologies. And so if you don't have the methodology agreed to up front, you're just opening the door for somebody who took one, one statistics course in college to try to blow a hole through through you like it's a bazooka bazooka right so like uh i'll give you an example of of one right i am a huge fan of being able to do like dose response type of studies so dose response for those of you that don't know you're building any sort of data science capability and you can track usage 
So, okay, I know that Laz signed on. He was interacting. He spent five minutes or whatever. He did 10 clicks or he downloaded 10 records or something. But Laz very clearly was using my thing. And then we've got Dave, who didn't use it at all. And then Laz sold more stuff than Dave. Therefore, the data science widget contributed. And you got to be very careful with how you lang uh, phrase that contributed i didn't say it drove it i didn't say it was the sole reason that last sold anything i just said look we have two sales people both alike in dignity right in fair verona right but one guy is <laughs> one guy is using the thing one guy isn't like that that seems to be the observable difference you do that kind of a study it gives you at least a grounding right but what's the first thing someone's going to say well i mean Laz is just a better salesperson or like it's not the tool it's that he's open-minded and he's resourceful like they're, they're looking for the mm, confounder okay right because they took it they took one stats course maybe even not even from the math department they took it from like the psych department or something so and they're just like i'm looking for confounders because i'm going to rug pull the smartest guy in the room which is the the dark side of the data science coin. Oh, mm -hmm. they're so smart. Well, let me try to one up them. <laughs> so, they can use you as 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 a tool to like increase status. their own yeah. status. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I pointed out the confounder that that dunked on the data science guy. I'm like, I'm like, where's 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 my Fields Medal? Uh, <laughs> I love this. So. You got to agree going in. Hey, we're going to conduct the measurement like this. We're going to use a dose response study. We're going to look at high users, low users. And then to further reduce the risk of selection bias, we're going to compare them to themselves year over year or like pre and post. So you're doing like two layers of study to try to control for as much as you can. And then you say, I'm, I'm only asking for you to believe that we contributed to the good outcome, not that we are the sole reason that it happened. So that's an example where if you don't do that up front, if you don't get the commitment up front in writing, please get it in writing, then when you get to impact time, and that's going to be a lot later because you have to let the thing run. Mm. I, need, I need my app to be out for three, six, nine, 12 months before I could tell you if it works, right? And so if that's the case, now we're in the post. Now we're, now we're doing the measurement. Now imagine I do a measurement. Now, in, you know, the data scientists are all circled up. We're like, okay, we got a guy who loves epidemiology. We're going to use that epidemiological framework here. Uh, this is like the gold standard for where you can't do randomized control trials. Uh, blah, blah, blah. We're, we're quoting experts. We got like, oh, man, I got Ron Getzel here in the quotes, right? All this good stuff. <laughs> you go and you sit down. I got David Chenoweth and Ron Getzel. We're going. We're going. We're going to go get them, right? You sit down. They're like... Nah, selection bias, you lose. And it's like, okay, right? And, and it's all it takes. Like, it's, uh, I think it came up in like the movie Heat, right? Where they're like, we only have to catch the bad guys once, but they have to get away from us every time. Like, all mm -hmm. they have to do is kind of like mm -hmm. throw one, one good one kill rush. shot, yeah. Yeah, and then it's a kill shot. And so, mm -hmm. uh, because again, you're in that deeply subordinate position at that point. And mm -hmm. it's also been six months or, or 12 months or even just three months. The context might be different. Back then, maybe maybe the business was going great. And they're like, yeah, sure, little data science. Yeah, everyone nerd. at school, yeah. Mm -hmm. Then you have two bad quarters in a row, and you're like, okay, guys, by the way, I would like to stake an impact claim. And they're like, you can't stake an impact claim when the entire company is suffering. What impact did you have? We lost money two quarters in a row. It's a good point. So <laughs> that, that's why it needs to be both. You need to try to make sure that you're working on the right stuff up front because that's going to make the impact claim that much easier because if you're like, I'm going to stake an impact claim on something nobody asked me to do or that the wrong – like the, the, that the right people didn't ask me to do. Let me put it that way. Uh, they're like, okay, but that, that's bullshit. No one asked you to do that. So you're already dead in the water. Or – uh, I did it with this measurement approach. We're going to measure instead of like actual sales, we're measuring, uh, let's say, RFPs or opportunities to sell because that's the problem that we were solving with our data science. They're like, uh, that's who gives a shit. I want the actual dollars. Oh, okay, sorry. We set up the we set up to accomplish the wrong goal and we set up the wrong measurement. Mm. Now you're, again, your DOA. Then you get so okay. We're going to do this problem with this KPI. And it's going to right. 
few months go by, here are the results, and we agreed that these were the critical results. Yes, fine, I, I'm bound by all of my agreements. I guess you're okay. Now, they might, they, might get, it might, they might give you the impact claim begrudgingly, but you've prepared so much that, that it's just basically, speaks yeah, for itself. Like, yeah, this is Cialdini consistency bias. It's like yeah. we all agreed multiple times, even in the, even the situation where like the business context got, got bad. Like, hey, guys, we all agreed that, that this was going to happen. I would argue, given where we are, so it's been two quarters of losses, but I still have positive impact. My tools are mitigating the decline. Right? So who knows how bad it could have gotten if, if we weren't here? That's very difficult to prove scientifically. And suddenly everybody becomes a scientist when you're in the situation. But the point still stands. It's like the ones who used it actually improved year over year. Now, mind you, I'm being killed because only 2% of people are using it. But it's very clear, very loud signal that those guys are doing well. And they're doing better than even without the, the – the, we have the study set up so that it's even in the absence of the tool, it's better. It's an improvement. So that you, have to, you have to acknowledge that, okay, data science is doing something. There's something happening here, and now we can move away from data science. You're on the defensive to justify your existence, and it's more like, hey – organization how can we drive more adoption and that was mm. one of the findings of my very very first study as a professional data scientist we had a program that worked but it had critically low adoption and that's yeah. why it was losing money so that's why it's got to be pre and post it's probably way too many words to answer the question but you know this have is it. it's got to be holistic like the playbook's got to be holistic because if you don't do it up front you're doa and then you need to be flexible afterwards because the afterwards is, is the measurement. You can't measure something before it happens. So it has to, there's like an, in, an irreducible amount of, of afterness that you have to consider. So, so the only reason why this whole like wholesome answer is problematic is because I have so much, so many questions <laughs> and I have so, so much to add that we might, it might eat up the whole episode. <laughs> Dig in. This is the most, I, I do believe like okay, all okay. Very, this is probably the most important thing we'll cover with the playbook. Cause this is what to do when the enemy is raining down mortars on your, okay. No, your and, and, yeah. and it's so aligned with everything that's happening also with a bunch of our members. I think a lot of people can kind of feel that risk. A lot of people know that oh, some yeah. risk is out there, but they can't really put their finger on it. And I think that this comes down to the, the impact claim. And then oh, yeah. as you said, the impact time, okay. When it's impact yeah. time, not like, not like if it's impact time, but when it's, it's only a matter of sure. when, when, so you said a few things there. One is like, uh, wrong person, wrong problem, wrong time frame. So yep. first of all, and I, and I know we already kind of talked about it, but I think it's a perfect time here to, to spend a little bit of time on who is the right person. So what are the, the, the hallmarks of the right person? How do you identify them? So as simple and even crass as this is going to sound, follow the money. Okay, especially in large, as corporations get bigger, you end up with executives of, prog of like progressively smaller and more specialized things that all ultimately funnel into like a function. So uh, rather than continue to use my background, I'm going to try to use HR. So you might have a CHRO and that person's in charge of all of the HR functions, but then it will break into like compensation and benefits. Maybe there's a uh, like hiring and firing person. There might be like, they might use uh, uh, the multiple HR functions and then comp and benefits will break off again and you'll have the benefits and the comp. Now the comp person is trying to figure out, okay, uh, what salaries should we have? What kind of bonuses should we have? They might have an executive compensation branch. Okay. But all of these are, you know, directorates, executive directorates, senior directorates, even associate vice presidents. Hell, they might be vice presidents themselves, right? Because that what ends up happening is, okay, okay, this, this corporation has gotten so big and so complex that we now need a vice president of compensation. And their whole job is to figure out what to pay whom and to make sure it happens. Okay, in conjunctions with their friends in accounting. And it's a 30-person team. You got 30 people, you're probably a vice president. So, mm -hmm. right? 
Now, imagine that you're in the data science vertical and somebody from comp walks over and they're like, I've got this really great idea for an alternative compensation scheme for sales where we're going to do like a quadratic commission instead of linear commission. And then you work, okay, now they're back in my domain. Oh, I work for the sales group and somehow we cross paths and now we're going to try quadratic commission. And we're going to do a bunch of work and we're going to build out the scheme and we're gonna, I'm going to build a really complicated simulation to make sure it works. Maybe I'll call my buddy Kadir. Let's do agent-based modeling. I know you got a doctorate in that. Let's do some crazy stuff. And then all of a sudden, six months go by, me and the VP of compensation, who, no, again, no one asked the comp, like the, right? Nobody in the sales organization asked them to touch this. And suddenly, we go back and we pitch it to like the SVP of commercial. And they're like, why are you working on commission? You have too much time on your hands. You don't need 10 people. You need five people. Great. I just freed up a million bucks from my budget because I, I'm getting the charge back from the analytics department. So that's where it's germane to your mandate. And it's a vice president level person who could vouch for you, but they have no bearings on the success, really the success or failure of the person who's actually paying for your team. So that's a completely fictitious example. But it shows you how you can work wrong person, wrong problem, and ultimately the person you need to keep happy is the one that's funding you. Now, here's where it gets tricky. Depending on the level of seniority, they may not be available to give you the direction. Or they might say, oh, I'm so far removed from the day-to-day. -day. Like, I need you to go, like, down a few levels in my organization. But at least you need, like, I guess the organizations widen as you go down. So, okay, which of the seven branches that come back to you at the trunk do you think has the – where you want me to focus? Right? So if it's commercial, you know, I'll use this company as, an, again, fictitious example, but is it recruiting more providers? Is it identifying more hospitals to place them at? Is it doing market research to figure out where the diseases and the people are going so we can future-proof? Like, is it operation? Is it inwards? Like, hey, uh, how, much, how many phone calls should we make per day? Is it more of that kind of like, is it operations? Is it sales? Is it recruiting? Is it like which one of those four is it market research? Like which of those four do you think would be the most valuable, right? Or at CVS, is it product? Is it find a customer? Is it broker? Is it whatever? But you have to have that, like the 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 person in charge that funds you has to sanction where you're digging your dig site. Then you can work with a local expert to figure out okay, exactly what you're going to do. But you got to have the person that pays you on board because at the end of the day. If they don't feel like they got their value, they're not going to fund you. So a quick question around this, because it yeah. feels like that it, this requires a significant amount of business knowledge. Two types of business knowledge, I mean. One in general, just business literacy, that you can think in business terms, you understand business fundamentals, how an organization operates on a business level, um, and also knowing your particular business too, like what what are the uh, structures that are particular to an organization, what is the general atmosphere, what is the market trend that drives it, what are the key market trends that are applying certain pressures on the business, right? So how do you, how do you get your own business information and business understanding and literacy? Do you have like a best practice for that or is it just like... So... There was a, a, a decent amount of time where it was just naivete, and it's like, okay, I'm talking to a vice president, so I must be good. Like, I'm good. Like, I got a vice <laughs> president. And then what was happening, or what has happened, is you start to realize, just by being in, in different rooms or interacting with different people, you'll start to hear certain names. And then you'll start to be able to map out the power dynamics and the financing dynamics of the organizations. And that's not, you know, this, this plays into discovery a bit because it's, 
you keep, unless you know that you've got a really, really strong relationship, these are not usually questions that can be asked directly. Right? Like, you can't say something like, oh, so, like, does the CFO have everybody over a barrel here? Or does the CMO have everybody over a barrel? You can't ask questions like, they're, they're untold. Yeah, of course. These are not, and, and there's right. no data on it. It's not on the website. It's not right. on, right. Not, not logged anywhere. Sure. Or, like, you know, if, you know, again, this is completely fictitious, but it's amazing at how certain teams can acquire influence when they don't necessarily seem like they're core. So actually, I'm going to step out of fiction. I'm just going to say a mm -hmm. prior employer, the IT department became the most powerful department in the company. Because... Uh, yeah, how did it happen? Because... One, it was the second longest serving person in the company. So survival, like power tends to gravitate towards long tenure. The longer you're there, you know all the bodies are buried. Uh, you know how to play the game. And so when, you, when you know, you're in a room and you might have like the, the CMO, five years of experience, CIO, 20 years of experience at the company, uh, maybe like the CADO, one year. Okay. The CADO might even be the highest paid person in the room, but that CIO has been there for 20 years. They've got tremendous, just like a lot of people owe them favors. They're well connected, they're well networked, and they know stuff and they can sandbag and do other stuff. So, like in that last organization, there was a couple of reasons why they became so influential. One, tenure. Two, they deliberately made it so that everybody in their department only knew part of how all the, the pieces fit together. And they were the only person in the company who knew how all the technology things fit together. Okay. So just as like a small example, you'd have uh, SQL. People understand SQL. Uh, I'm pretty sure everybody that tunes in knows SQL. The table structure was a bit weird where like they didn't have intuitive names it'd be like oh pz one two three four that's actually this number oh that's what it translates to but if this field is set to this value now it's the phone number and it's like what they're like oh we did that to to economize so that we don't have to use so many gigabytes or whatever it's like so you have a field just because there were like multiple 10 digit numbers that are relevant to this business it's conditioned on this other field, whether it's a phone number, an account number, social security number. I mean, really? What? And they're like, yeah, <laughs> it, it makes the table run faster too. But like they would, they would, so there'd be like one person who knew how that table worked, but they wouldn't know how the other table worked. And the other table, again, you might have a column where it's, it's a proper noun, very clearly a proper noun, but you're like David, Laszlo, Mercedes, okay. Still names, potentially. Infinity? Who named their kid Infinity? Wait a minute. It's people when this is true, and then it's cars when this is like, what is going on with this table? <laughs> and people are like, there's no way. I'm like, no, a yes way. Because, like, I remember that I said, I, I, this is where I coined the term, like, I'd rather chew glass than deal with this data. Uh, chewing glass as a metaphor came from this experience. But this person had amassed a system basically design a system where it's like if they go down the entire tech system is basically pointless because you've got like you know i've got one person who i speak to in greek i've got one person that i speak to in japanese i can speak both but they can't talk to each other and like that was what they <laughs> built so that was like nefarious but you know there's all these different ways where people can just like amass power mm -hmm. the ceo says we're gonna zig in my heart i believe that we should zag and I control an area where I can very gently put us on like a slightly zaggy trajectory and justify it by saying, well, you don't understand the, the intricacies of what I do. Uh, it does lead to a zig. Right? Now you, you, know, you can imagine uh, like someone who controls pricing. Right? Now, pricing is a very, very intricate discipline very difficult problem mm. but if they believe that okay uh we're gonna focus on 
whatever uh, services instead of products or something like that. I'm just making this up. Mm. Uh, I'm going to strategically start to move the pricing in a way that supports my belief, even though you know it's like four degrees of separation before the CEO figures out that I'm sort of like undermining or contradicting their strategy. So that's just like the way that some mm. of this power can amass. And you don't know that because that's not in, a, in an org chart that, and you can't ask those questions directly. You have to observe and find out, but you know, it's not that difficult or inappropriate to, in a different way, say, Hey, how is our team funded? And if you don't know that answer, your vice president, your, your boss, mm. probably did, or somebody will eventually be like, Oh, there's a chargeback on this team's P and L for you guys. That's vanilla corporate accounting. That's always safe. Mm -hmm. How are we funded? Knowing that like, okay, so VP one, two, three is funding me, but VP ABC actually is controlling everything. That's much harder. So you want to be able to please both of them. Meanwhile, VP XYZ is just noise. So you got to mm. like avoid letting VP XYZ flood your queue because one, two, three might dunk on X, Y, Z, and you're the collateral damage because even though you're never going to find anybody to say, we don't need analytics, you will find that you're the easiest scapegoat because a lot of what we do, the, the quantifying the impact is genuinely difficult. Like I'm not going to, mm. I said dose response is my favorite approach, but it doesn't mean that it's foolproof or that it'll always work or that it's easy. It just is like, that's a design I prefer. But if, if if someone hears this and like, oh, I'll just use those response, I can leave the rest of the podcast in the garbage. It's going to be easy. Uh, <laughs> you're going to have a bad time because there's so much of this power, like soft and hard power, that if you're not aware of it, you're going to get you're going to get burned. Okay, so th this is a fascinating answer because even with the you know uh, wrong person at the end, and who is the right person? Um, so your system for it is uh you know less about calculating like project impact first but it's actually okay based on the human relationship ecosystem in the organization where should i actually prioritize so you go from the human yeah. direction very interesting because you can't successfully quantify the impact of a project that was not sanctioned by the actual power players if they choose to zero you out, okay, what are, like, and to deconstruct that, you could have a project that you executed perfectly, and then you're like, it has a clear impact. I have a beautiful study, and they couldn't even find a confounder. But if the impact isn't a super, like a big, such a big number that the powers that be are like, all right, it's cool then you've basically opened the door to that sort of death knell. And that's assuming everything went right. Now, if you've got tepid impact from your own study or methodologically, you ha like I have to make some assumptions here, otherwise we're, we're DOA. And then you've got the powers that be didn't bless your work before it started. Nothing rubs the soft power master the worst, the most, Sorry, nothing rubs them the wrong way more. There we go. Than you doing something that they didn't bless. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you'll often, and, and sometimes when that happens, it's like, why do you care? It says nothing. It's like me, I'm over here, them over there, they're funding me, I'm doing work for them. Why do you need to be consulted? It's like, well, actually, I control everything. So <laughs> I, it's like, oh, well, I didn't know that. So that's the like the naive <laughs> that's K. I knew that, but I should have known. Then you then you become aware of that, and you're like, oh, great, I've got to go genuflect at the altar of Team X every time I want to get something done. <laughs> I like that mental image. Uh, okay, so so no, th this is fascinating. So this was the wrong person. Then what about the again the 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 wrong problem? We kind of covered this a little bit, but what would you add maybe as additional or existing context? Yeah. So the, again, we're going to pull up from the discovery session, but generally speaking, you know, you're going to have a couple different scenarios when you're trying to filter out the wrong problem. So one is the person asking you to, to do it. Are they a representative user, a canonical user, mm. archetypal user? Probably not. 
because usually like VP of X will say, hey, I got an idea for you guys. It'll be used by people down there, so to speak. Okay. If they're not a user, then to avoid working on the wrong problem, say, hey, use a Voss question. Hey, would you be opposed to workshopping this with some of the intended users just so we make sure that it's going to have the intended effect? At no point did you challenge them and say, like, I think it's a stupid idea or I don't trust you. It's just like, I, I love the idea, ready to partner with you on this. Can we just make, get a couple of intended users to make, you know, to make sure we're working? It's going to do what we think it's going to do, right? So that's one, when it's not a user. If it is a user, okay, if it is a user, then the biggest risk is you're going to work on a project of convenience, not transformation. So what does that mean? Project of convenience is anything that's just going to make their life go faster, right? Transformation is like a step change in the way that the company operates. And I'll use one of my own projects as an example. So prior to the birth of my prospecting tool, there was no way to know what prospects worked with which middlemen. It just didn't exist. Either you had to manually assemble it by going through Salesforce, or you had tribal knowledge, or the middleman was just a bit loose-lipped and mentioned that they work with Acme and, and uh, you know, Musclo Inc. and stuff like that. <laughs> but then you create this thing, and now any sales rep can basically thumb through find the middleman and see their entire client portfolio. Transformative, never existed, yeah. now it exists. You've taken a massive amount of information asymmetry and you've erased it. Now you have information symmetry. That's transformative. Convenience would be like, oh, can you just like add an easy button so it'll take the 30 clients and just show me the, the five that would be the best fit for us? So like, I don't have to look at all 30 and think about what the best five would be. Now, is that a good hmm. data science problem? Well, yes and no. Yes, because it's, it's very much a mathematical problem. You can translate that into math. Two, it's probably fun to work on. Three, it builds hmm. on top of a successful application. So the easy button seems like a natural fit, but all the, all the, easy, the easy button might take you six months of development. Time. I don't know how long it would take. Right, because you have to build an algorithm. Oh, what do you mean by the best? Do you mean mm. lifetime value? Do you just mean likelihood to convert this year? Do you mean uh, projected profits, which could be different than lifetime value? Maybe they're going to stick around for a long time, but they're you not understand super... the incentive structure of the right. user like, and all best? that. Yeah. Right. What do you mean by mm. best? Or you know, maybe you're just trying to get straight up membership. That's one thing, but or, or but if you aren't, if you're trying to get dollars that's a different optimization criteria so a lot of different ways you can optimize then you've got to optimize and then there's a natural question well if you mean the best customers with this middleman well why don't i say here are the best middlemen given these customers so it's mm. like you can start mm. to rotate and transpose the problem so that's a lot of work six mm. months right three months six months nine months 12 months whatever but it's not transformative it's a convenience play mm. right or you know Master data management is a huge pain in the neck. Who owns who, right? And any B2B person is going to know this one. It's like, oh, I was selling into, into the data storytellers. Oh, but they're actually owned by Numbers Media. So all of the effort I just expended on Laz was wasted because I should have been operating up here. Hmm. Or there's uh, data no, storytellers. No, an independent organization. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry. <laughs> there is no Numbers Inc. Yeah. Uh, the shadow organization. Or the corporation. Yeah. Uh, or like, you know, you might have data storytellers on my Salesforce and then the data storytellers on your Salesforce. Mm. And we think that we're both chasing unique leads. It turns out it's the same dude. So those are super annoying. They are unintentional wastes of time but if someone's like i need you to take a year whatever take on three months six months that whatever to build me a the, the like the best mdm solution available you can do that and mdm is good i this 
please, like, I don't want someone to like take this out of context. Dave Coughlin says MDM is a waste of money. <laughs> like the quote. Yeah, that's it. So, yeah, it's dose response and MDM is useless. That's those are the two things that will be taken out of context. No, MDM is a beautiful thing, especially as a data scientist. I love when the data is mastered because I hate having to master my own data. But is that really the best use of the data scientist's time? when the person who's actually funding the data scientist probably has bigger fish to fry. So you, what has to happen is, hey, user who needs MDM, you and I need, let, I'll partner with you to build a business case and maybe we can convince your boss's boss's boss that this is actually a major leak for the whole organization, right? Because most bosses, 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 boss, right? They don't want to hear, oh, man, and I, I lose an hour per week trying to figure out whether data storytellers and the data storytellers are the same color. Okay. But then you can help them realize, like, well, wait a minute. So that's actually 50 hours per year. And you've got 100 people working for you. So now uh, 50 becomes 5,000. And that's basically two FTEs. So if your FDEs are 100 grand a pop, you're wasting 200 grand. Now, and the scale of a company, maybe they care about 200 grand, maybe they don't. But the point is, you can get, you could build a case and maybe they're like, okay, it's going to cost me 10 grand to do MDM. And I'm going to get at a minimum a $200,000 benefit, 20 to 1 ROI. It's a tough pitch not to swing at. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But you got to have that kind of a pitch in order to get it sanctioned. Because if it, again, if it's not sanctioned by the powers of B, because if I say, oh, well, Laz asked me to work on it. Like, who's Laz? <laughs> He's the market guy from Florida. You didn't ask me if I wanted you to work on that. I'm paying you. Okay, sorry. Right? You do a few of those and suddenly they're like, oh, you're not indispensable. You are dispensable. So anyway, mm -hmm. that's the uh, wrong person, wrong project. Uh, the biggest risk with wrong project is uh, you, you get sucked into projects of convenience because we, we, we're sort of like, hybrids of data science and software engineering quite often. And then the other one is unclear connection to the KPI that everyone knows you're trying to do. So like, you know, when I worked in insurance, it might be ad members. When I work here, it's ad sales. Uh, when I worked at PwC, it might be like sell an additional engagement or sell an extension to an existing engagement. But these are all like measurable outcomes. And so even if it's transformative, it can be transformative, but then it doesn't have a clear enough connection where you could even get that dose response study. And they would believe you that it had an effect on the bottom line. Hmm. You got to be careful for doing those too. You can have a couple of like projects that feel good, but they're tough to measure in your portfolio, but that can't be the, the, the main course that has to be a side dish. Hmm. If your main course is stuff that feels good, but nobody can measure it, you will quickly feel that that like existential pressure on your budget because if I can't measure the outcome or the output, but I can definitely measure the input, it's going to be hard to justify the input. Hmm. So this is very interesting to me because one of the biggest pain points slash desires of senior analytics leaders today, just working with our members is like, how do I prioritize the right things? Prioritization, prioritization. And in the context of this data-driven business transformation, so you can differentiate between transformative projects and convenience projects, right? So those are like two ways to look at it. One has the potential for a massive transformational impact, or it will be just convenient for someone. Make kind things of, run better. Yeah, yeah. Kind of still a good thing, right? So, it's not, so convenience has a stigma, but it's just, it's a, it, we're creating a dichotomy so that we can grab sure. them. But making operations run better is, is a good thing. It's an inherently good thing. But it's different from that. Like, there's now a pre and a post. Like, we're clearly, we have changed. that, And that's that's really like. That's the difference I'm trying to make. Would you, I don't know, maybe it's too much of a granular question, but would you strategically use a convenience project for a particular person that what, do you want to nurture a partnership oh, or that, a yes. relationship? Oh, with? hell yeah. yeah right? Oh, hell yeah. Like, so like, the correct answer is not 0% convenience, it's 100 not which, transformative. Okay. You need a portfolio of projects. First okay. of all, transformative ones don't come around as, as often mm. as we would like. 
a lot of the data science stuff that we do is convenience at some level, right? Because if you think about the trade craft, it's about reducing uncertainty. It's about improving decision making. And then you need a way to package it so that lots of people can make better decisions. Now, sometimes the accumulation of lots of little better decisions can still have an outsized impact on the business. So that's your convenience play. Or, or other people like to say like little I innovation and big I innovation, which that one I think is more corny than helpful, but <laughs> it's fine. Like you can use it if you want, and I apologize for disparaging it. But, uh, but convenience versus transformation feels a little bit easier to sink your teeth into. So you can have, and the convenience play, like you said, can also help to ingratiate you to the movers and the shakers, right? We had to do that with our business. It was like, all right, we had a relationship and they're like, okay, I'm going to give you a couple of like layups. See if you can do this. If you hit it, well, we got some big juicy ones over here. But first, you gotta you gotta show me that you can take a layup before mm -hmm. I give you like yeah. a tough one that's going to make you lots of money. I've seen that in a lot of other places too. But uh, the biggest breakthrough I had previously in my career was we were trying to like break in with the sales organization, and we were doing like fairly like low on the sophistication totem pole projects but it was helping to build a relationship with people in the organization so then it kind of blossomed and we had a very ferocious advocate by the time we were done but it started with taking convenience plays so that they're like wow like my little microcosm is a little bit better because of you i'm gonna start to talk about that that's social proof that's cialdini right hmm. but that's also cialdini reciprocity so again the man himself he's coming up you're but that's why you do want some convenience in your portfolio because another thing that that is so important and i talk about this in my in my book but in a different context you hit the convenience projects and then when that transformation one's coming down the pipe, who are they going to call? If you're playing, you know, Casey Jones, the, the, the cartoon or the poem where he's they go, he's going to knock it out of the park and he passes on a couple of pitches. He gets like a, 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 I think he's like two and three. And then he strikes out and they're like, oh my God, Casey Jones struck out. Right. So if you're going to be Casey Jones and you're only going to swing at the fattest, juiciest, most exciting pitches, you might not even get asked to to go to bat whereas if you're consistently putting money in the bank whether it's rapport bank or business bank now you're at the table when that big thing comes around you mm. gotta be at the you gotta have both so one you can't rely on elephants sometimes you gotta grab the easy ones just so you can keep you know keep, keep eating but then two you won't even be invited to the elephant hunt if you haven't shown that you can take down a gazelle so no, anyway, that's that's a, why it's both. That's a great analogy. No, I, I love that, all, and I love it because it just in, introduces so much clarity into this. Yeah. And uh, third one was the time frame. So again, is there like what what are the considerations with regards to the time frame? Because you also mentioned this as a pitfall, wrong time frame. So it's more about context. So like, depends on the velocity of the business in a way. Like I'm in current business, very very high velocity. I will know within a month whether something's working or not. Last business, very, very slow. There was basically two sales seasons per year. You had two very mm. big like bumps. It's a bimodal sales distribution. So you might have to wait a full year to know if something worked. That sucks, but it's the, mm -hmm. it's the nature of the beast, right? You just don't get a lot of reps. So in that case, the context can change a lot in a year, right? Uh, I have a public profile. It's no secret. I was in the head of health insurance. July and January, those are the two big year, uh, months, excuse me. And I mean, the company's doing stuff the whole time. Mergers and acquisitions, divestitures, yeah, yeah. whatever, like things happen, right? Yeah. Same thing in, my, in this environment, but we get to do the experiments faster. Now, the reason why the content of the time frame can be risky is the following. One, it needs to burn in. Now, here's the thing. I'm getting paid bi-weekly. And I have built something and I can't tell you if it worked for a year. So there's a little bit of like a resentment. Like you've been collecting mm. a paycheck for 50 no, weeks <laughs> and I don't know if it worked. 
So can you de-risk that? So you might alter your measurement to say, okay, well, let me look at leading indicators and let's agree on what those are. And then we'll look on lagging indicators. And those are typically where the big money comes from, the lagging indicator, not the leading indicator. Mm. But at least the leading indicator will give you a sense of like, okay, we need to make a course correction or damn, this failed, let's try something different. But the bigger point that is, is really the contact, being context aware, okay? So if, and this was probably the hardest thing to sell into, the entire organization contracts and you're trying to say, I grew, at the end of the day, it's like fake news to give the devil his due, to strong man or to steel man their perspective. It's like, you can't sit here and tell me that you added a million dollars to the company's profits when the aggregate sum of the company is down $5 million. Now, you try, you could try to move the argument, you have to try to move the argument to like, okay, well, if we weren't having this demonstrable benefit, is it unreasonable to think you'd be down six, seven, eight million? You might be able to like thrust into that seam, but that's, that's where the context can be a real killer because hell, maybe everyone's getting laid off. Maybe everyone's getting zeroed out for impact. Like that friend in the audit, if mm -hmm. that restaurant chain is struggling, right? I mean, analytics is a pure cost center, right? I think you and, you and I might've talked about this in a different context, but it's like you when your company's not doing well, you strip everything and you go down to like the defensible core mm -hmm. and then you start to grow back out of it. Yep. Right. I think it was uh, uh, good to great might make that point too. Like hedgehogs, I think they just mm -hmm. like, they curl up before they can go back out. Mm. So, I mean, analytics makes things better, but analytics is not essential. Mm -hmm. Again, another great quote to take out of context. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's the theme of the episode, but like, <laughs> <laughs> Unless your company's yep. product is the analytics or the data, like companies, like the company I'm in now, it existed without. Yeah. And in theory, it could exist, continue to exist without. CVS, same thing. PW, I mean, same and, thing. And, and the case to be made is that with the, in the environment and with the trends, with regards to competitors, I mean, data science is becoming essential, but the case needs to be made and you demonstrated. You have to make the case. Yeah, you, you need to, to drive case. that narrative. You need to drive that narrative back to Right. Same thing with marketing. So let's let's take something that's a little bit emo less emotionally charged because we're all in the analytics. We're like, did he just say we're not essential? <laughs> Neither is marketing. <laughs> yeah. Is, right? yeah. Isn't it, in theory, you could cut off your marketing. In theory, And there's yeah. going to be a residual income that just happens. <laughs> Word of mouth. Product yeah, just discovery. Happens, yeah. Right. So like periodically I'll open up my dashboard and, and I haven't posted on LinkedIn about my book in a while. And I, I, oh, a sale. Oh, well, how lovely. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right? So I didn't, I didn't market it, but you know, uh, same thing with, with the insurance business that I was in. We could completely shut off marketing. One, the renewals will keep coming in as long as we don't screw up the business. But then, you know, brokers that we work with might shop a case and they know we exist because they're in the broker space. We don't have to market to them or, uh, you know, a person who is, you know, talking to a coworker, oh, we have, we have uh, CVS. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know they were in the insurance industry. Let me, mm -hmm. somehow let me run that up my flagpole. And now, now the CHRO is like, oh, let's make sure CVS is involved. Mm -hmm. Or like here, like we have relationships. They're going to continue to have relationships. And like the people that we work with, they'll move around. I guess a lot of ways of saying like, you can live without market. Okay. But man, that's stupid. Really dumb to not. Yeah, yeah, you wouldn't do right? that. Yeah. Though the question is, how much do you need, and how much is essential? And so that's where, like, okay, we showed a dose response effect, more marketing, more better, and then suddenly you've got you know thriving team, big marketing budget, uh, and that. So same thing with analytics, right? It's like, yes, you could shut all of it off and operate in the dark and go by the seat of your pants, and the company would still sort of lurch forward and. You know, if you're good at what you do, you'll still be able to make money, you'll still be able to run it. Or maybe you just have reporting. So you just have the facts every day, the facts, the facts, the facts. Fine, because again, that's important too. Uh, but then you're like, I'm trying to detect future patterns. Well, that, that's mm -hmm. solely the domain of analytics. So you can either always be in reaction mode or you can start to get in front of it. 
Hmm. Right? So that's why like analytics makes things run better. We're like a turbo thrown into a car. You could drive to the grocery store without a turbo, but I wouldn't want to race without a turbo. Maybe I, don't hmm. know, maybe I might have just overplayed the metaphor there. But. No, and, and, and the car analogy is interesting because what I was thinking is that there was a big transformation that took place, still is taking place in the automotive industry, especially, especially automotive uh, suppliers. Yeah. These cars need to be built and you know all these big car brands have a bunch of suppliers. Um, we work with many of those. And I know that there, one of the transformations that happened is that analytics found its way into the product and the service. Yeah, because of the manufacturing technology improvement and all of that. Now, I don't know if that's something that you can maybe strategically influence or push because now with the maturation of analytics and data science and just in general, like everyone is kind of warming up to it in a way that maybe there are opportunities that are you know, more easily um, achievable and executable than they were only like a couple of years ago. So what do you think about that? Maybe it's like a, it's like a thought left field, but... Do you think that's like a strategy that a data science leader could influence to encourage analytics to be integrated into the fulfillment side of the business so that you become uh, in, like uh, indispensable? Yes. Uh, not only that, I'm going to take it that one step further because I agree with that idea, right? So like, can we be part of how like move into the revenue center to be like a tattoo on the revenue center? Yeah. yeah. Let's go even further. Are there ways to become the revenue, meaning yeah. you're commercializing your capabilities, whether yeah. it's a patent, whether it's, you know, in my, my current role, we're all competing. It is a red ocean. There is no world where I could say, oh, you know, we're just going to give a thing to a competitor because that's not really a market for us anyway. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there's no cannibalization. But in insurance, where it's so geographically constrained. Mm -hmm. You could imagine if it's like, hey, listen, we have zero network in Georgia making it up. Hopefully none of my former colleagues are like, Georgia's our best state, you <laughs> idiot. Well, <laughs> yeah. But like, I'm just picking a state at random, Georgia. So if we don't have anything in Georgia, it means we can't do business in Georgia because we don't have a network. So either we can spend all the money and do all the work to build a network in Georgia, or I can sell my uh, prospect detector to Blue Cross of Georgia. Mm -hmm. Or, mm -hmm. and this is why, and again, I'm sure someone's going to dunk on me when I say this, but like <laughs> when Disney decided to make Disney Plus, I still don't understand the, the strategy. Mm. Because they have all of the content that people want. And they are really good at making content. At least they were, right? And so, why not just license the content? It's like rent. It's like free money, right? You've already made it. Why go through the hassle of managing an app, hosting your own servers, all of that stuff? Like, yeah, you might get a bigger overall pie, but is the profit that much higher compared to like almost zero effort to license the content that everybody wants? Like whatever happened, like, I don't know if like Netflix dropped the ball or, or there's something that Disney knows that I don't know. Hey, I'll, I'm not in the entertainment business. I'm perfectly uh, willing to admit I probably have a huge blind spot here, but like I have a, I have a few, few comments yeah, <laughs> <They're> everywhere. But, <laughs> right? but like to, to me, it was like, why would, why would you not just license the content and get free money? Yeah. Okay. Right? So yeah. that's, yeah. that's where like, if you can license your data science content to a non-competitor, why wouldn't you? Right? Wouldn't so, you? Yeah. yeah, if I could, if I, I've created a model, I've created a proprietary data set, I can't monetize all of it. So let me give you pieces of it that you can monetize. We'll be two independent players. And now you're dependent upon me. And I've monetized the state of Georgia, even though there was no way I was going to monetize the state of Georgia. I think uh, back in the day, Steve Jobs days, there was yeah. something like this between Apple and Samsung, where uh, no one, they were like the boo Apple and Samsung. That was like the vibe of the day. Um, and there was this huge lawsuit because uh, I think Samsung was made, made itself depend. No, Apple was dependent on Samsung. Some greens uh, or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so this is interesting because the sp specific situation with Disney Plus. 
okay, let me just say that we have uh, members everywhere. And I know that what happened there, and I didn't know, I mean, they didn't dive and dig into the whole Disney situation of what happened. But apparently, Disney Plus hit all its planned milestones because the milestones were produced shows. It was like bandwidth, and that's what was needed. So, so on, on, on that front of get things produced and make, make them available, I mean, it's not an easy thing. Can you imagine what goes into building a platform and filling it up with, with content? It's insane. It's insane. Like, just think about like this uh, uh, advanced business communication and storytelling for, uh, and uh, business communications for data storytellers. Like, what goes into producing something like that right? you know, from, from, right. from ideation? So it's huge. And this is really good at producing stuff. Yes. Uh, so so, so, so they were, I mean, I mean uh, they are really good at getting things done on that front. So they hit all those metrics and it financially crushed the company because basically what happened is that they were just very focused on the production. The plan was, hey, just produce a bunch of good stuff. And then we hit it. The, the stuff is out there, you know, build the day will come type of thing. But the, the business reality is more complex underneath. And it basically, it, it was a huge financial hit to the company. And that was a massive round of layoffs. I think it was last year, if you remember. It happens and it's all the time, by the way, but we're kind of like insensitive to it now. If a company lays off like 20% of their employees or something, and, um, and, and that happened. So the answer to the question here is that, no, that, that was their thinking, and it was just fault, faulty thinking. Um, yeah. Bob, Bob Iger, give me, give me a call if you want to talk next time. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, so uh, anyways, when wh- we started talking about the Disney uh, 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 situation was, oh, yeah. So, so you said Moving that your data is- science content into the exactly. direct revenue exactly. pipeline. So better than being part of the sales process, better than being part of fulfillment is to be the product. Yeah, yeah and, exactly. You know, in the healthcare industry, like, it's, again, like United's Optum, subsidiary does a whole cornucopia of things like it's it's actually like super impressive to see where they pop up and i'm like wow those guys really do everything but they were white labeling stuff that we were selling we were white labeling stuff that they were selling. so i was just like you develop a core competency you figure out how to how to monetize it you protect yourself from cannibalization why can't we do that as data scientists now it's not easy it's very hard because if your whole focus is to make your company run better, which is ultimately what we do, we don't really want to make your competitors run better. That's just bad for everybody. But can you find something that's like orthogonal to your industry? So, you know, if, for example, uh, we do staffing here, but we don't do anything with, say, custodial. So if a hospital needs a surgeon, hey, call your buddies over here at Barton, we'll get you a surgeon. But if you need janitors, like, okay, we can't do that. But, oh, hey, you, you're starting a janitor business? Let's help. We, we can help you scout for hospitals that might need janitors, assuming that there's some carryover between us. And now I've monetized my core competency without threatening my core business. So that's a different, that's another way to look at it. Uh, but if you can, then you become financially independent, and then you can work on what you want to work on. Because remember, go back to working for the wrong person. Well, if I fund your team, you ultimately have to have everything blessed by me or the person who controls me if there's like some shadow power. But if you're a profit center, you're not beholden to me anymore. Now, you still need to have some sort of an anchoring in the business and stuff, mm-hmm. but don't don't be abrasive or don't be a jerk. But you're way less fragile. Yeah, exactly. When you've got your own mind, it's just like everyone with their parents. Yeah. You live at home, my house, my rules, right? And then you're independent. You're working. You got your own place, and all of a sudden, it's like I don't have to listen to my parents anymore. Or other various places where you suddenly are independent and you no longer have to be beholden to, to something. So that's, that's where I'm building on the, your idea of like getting into the revenue process, make your own revenue process. That's, that's like the Holy grail if you can get there. And um, it's also on top of mind for me right now, because um, with like what we're doing with our, our members too, it's like your next big data transformation push, because that's what everyone's looking for. Okay. I'm going to now, 
make a push, get people aligned, get people organized, launch a campaign, get a bunch of projects done in order to. Um, and with this, what I see is that you planning on where you're going to put your bets in this is just so crucially important. And we, I just built this kind of a checklist, like a 12 step checklist of before your next big data transformation push, like, do you have these things in place? It's almost like, you know, the plane is taking off. You need to like, yep. check certain things. Checklist manifesto. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yep, yep, and, yep. and with this, what I found is that one of the, one of the key questions that need to be asked is that, Hey, will you be resilient to all these inevitable changes and the inevitable scenarios and situations. So that's why this whole advanced business communications thing, that's what it does. It makes you resilient for yeah. these uh, um, scenarios. So this is really cool. And by the way, we'll, we'll need to probably land this plane in, in like 10 minutes. Uh, so impact claim almost like took up, took up a whole episode. And I think there's still, I know that we kind of pulled from the discovery thing, but there's so much to talk about. Uh, there still uh, with impact claims. I know that I might have derailed the conversation by all these questions that I was asking. <laughs> I don't think so. No, it's all important stuff. And and and, and did we exhaust the impact claim uh, 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 topic? Because I, I feel like there's still stuff so to talk about. I think about. I think what we haven't done enough of is is to make sure that we surface the tactics. Okay. Because you know, synthesis and playbook are supposed to go hand in hand. Yeah. We've done, I think, a really good job with the theoretical, but let's get tactical for me. It's almost like a quick fire, quick round. Sure. No, I love it. Just like tactical things, right? So when you're trying to stake an impact claim, regardless of the environment, the person across from you is at least partially incented to zero you out. So adopt that mindset. Like this is semi-adversarial to start. You need to make it collaborative. Just starting from an adversarial disposition, which is different from the change, the, the product thing where you're typically starting from a place that I got something cool and you want it. Now it's, I did something, I want you to justify it. So first thing is, and I say this every time, get your no questions with Mr. Voss, right? Is it unrealistic that better decisions would lead to better outcomes? Is it unreasonable to think that data science can help people make better decisions? Therefore, is it out of the realm of possibility that data science has led to better outcomes? Like you've got to start to gently claw your way into a place where they're ready to acknowledge that you had an impact. Okay. No chaining is fine. Yes, chaining is deadly. And these people are going to be mm -hmm. fairly senior. They're going to they're gonna smell your yes chain if you try to do that. So don't try to yes chain. Then we get into social proof, okay? Again, we're, we're repeating a little bit from the last episodes, but the reason these tactics work is because they're so versatile. So here, you need people from the business to say that your widget affected their business. Now, if the SVP runs the P&L for the whole country, get the VP who runs a territory. If it's the VP who runs a territory you're trying to convince, go find the director who runs off sub-territory. The point is you need someone in the business to sign off on that number. So if I say, because of my thing, we made $10 million, that's me grading my own test. Of course, I gave myself an A+. Plus. I need someone with credibility from the business to give me an A+. Plus. Okay, that's really what the social proof is. It's the business is willing to co-sign it because they're taking a risk, right? And even though this isn't literally going to happen, they're not going to be like, oh, you made 10 million bucks because of Dave? I'm going to lower your commission. That never happens. That never will happen. But I think that's a little bit of a nervousness. So you have to be able to kind of like glide through that apprehension and just say, hey, you know, we see this number. We observed it by studying it in this way. You know, what do you think? And then kind of get them on board. Now, pivoting for a second to methodology, if you don't get the methodology ahead of time, you're basically DOA at the readout. But you're going to want to, in the building phase, they're going to be, again, crocodile. What can I, can I ignore you without consequence? So again, from Voss, Voss does a great job with this. Help me help you basically. So 
Instead of saying, would you believe in a dose response study? Would you believe in match control? Would you believe quasi experimental? Would you believe uh, temp temporal disruption or whatever it's called? <laughs> but instead of just throwing out methodologies, right? It's okay. Like, what is the burden of proof here? What kind of proof points are you looking for? What, like, what, what, what could I show you where you'd be like, all right, it, it's you guys, right? Now it's it's risky because if they're going to be like super anti partnership, mm. they might be like, well, no, you don't actually sell, therefore you can never get credit for selling. Then you're probably actually talking to the wrong person, mm. right? Because I, th I I think it was Claff. One of one of the books that we've been talking about talks about like make sure you're talking to the actual decision maker. So yeah. if some if if like the CFO is the person that you really got to get to say yes, get, you need them to say yes, and you're talking like a director in the finance department, they might just be gatekeeping you into submission. Mm -hmm. So if you're like, what kind of proof point would show impact? It's impossible. All right get out of my face i'm not going to try to turn a hard no into a soft mm. yes i'm going to see if i can find somebody who's going to entertain like hey is it ridiculous to think that we had an impact if mm -hmm. this this is true like mccraney mm -hmm. right bringing the mccraney if i updated your model and said that this was true like would you right and so then you start to make the traction okay if these things were true then i would be open to the inference that data science made a difference there you go that's probably the decision maker but there's people lower in the organization. They don't give a shit. They'll just gatekeep you into submission. So you got to watch out hmm. for those. So help me out. What like what method would convince you? What metric would convince you? And if they're just like, no, 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 then the, the tactic is go find someone else. If Or they're being productive. They're like, you know what? If you could get some user testimony, I'll be happy with that. Oh, I don't even have to do a study. I just have to go find some users. Right? Uh, and then the last one is... You know, yes without how is garbage. So if somebody agrees with the study, if somebody agrees with the methodology, if somebody agrees that you're working on the right project, at the very least, keep it in writing. Get that sign off. Check in periodically. Get you know, Define leading indicators so that you can solve the right – make sure you're always solving the right problem. Make sure that you're holding on to that yes because you've got that how to keep that yes for the entire period of the product's life cycle and you avoid dying on screen. You don't want to die on screen. Nobody wants to die on screen, right? If you're going to die, die off screen, have those check-ins. Hey, uh, looks like you're not having an impact, but it's a small meeting so you can make a pivot instead of a big meeting where your budget's going to be decided. That's death. That's death. Big meeting. Hey, uh, did you approve that funding? No. <laughs> okay, problem. So that's a very, very quick overview about the the tactics now there's like two other scenarios that you're gonna see which would be uh just i think that this abc was more impactful than you in your data science the happy path is you can link them together like hey oh so you think that uh better prospecting led to more sales and not data science well how familiar are you with the data science that's improving our prospecting oh i had no idea that was you guys ah there we go done okay now you got now you've kind of globbed on to their root cause and you're fine uh you are the root root cause as i like to call it of, of what they, the superficial metric that they were looking at uh if there's no connection like they're like oh actually it was the marketing you're like ah damn it i was supporting sales the whole year not marketing uh at that point the tactic is okay. So let's say how well, what percentage do you think that covered? Forty percent. Great. How much of the remaining sixty percent do you think better prospecting might have contributed? Ten percent. Is ten percent of the prize enough to justify your team's existence? Maybe. Right. If it's a huge number, like mm -hmm. hundred million bucks, and you get to take ten million of that for yourself. <laughs> That's still positive ROI unless you have a gigantic organization, right? Hmm. So uh, you don't fight the battle. This is the thing, the last tactic, and then we'll pivot to landing the plane. You're not trying to fight the battle where they say that ABC was more impactful than data science. It's either you're connecting the two or you're saying, like, fine, I concede. How much is left over? And then of that leftover, how, like, what do you think we might have helped with? And then you could potentially get some credit.
because the goal is to like it's almost like an inception thing or the McCraney, right? You want to plant the seed that you had an impact and let it sort of grow in the dark before it before it bursts out and, and blooms. So we've covered all the tactics I had prepped for today. It was a bit of a of a blast at the end there, but but I think uh, and we talked about how to do the actual measurement. Dose response is is my favorite. Chain of evidence is even better. Like if you can say this prospect came out of my my tool, for example, or this lead, and you can follow it, that's the best. But that's that that not every system can can accommodate that. But dose response is, is almost always available, and it's it's a it's a fairly got a lot of good literature underneath it. So um, I'll quit vomiting tactics, and we can we can now land the plane on uh, so... how to deal with an impact claim. <laughs> <laughs> so this is so good that the beginning of the next episode, after our usual thirty minute off uh, of the air uh, friendship, uh, friendship, yeah, <laughs> that's uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it depends. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So after that uh, thirty minute friendship block, uh, then what we will do is we'll do a quick recap of this actually because I love it so much and it's. Again, it, on its own, it took up the whole episode and it could have taken up more as well. Yeah. And I have questions and even comments on that. But really what I love about this whole thing, it follows that same pattern of, as you nailed it down in the very beginning, it's a semi-adversarial situation at best. Um, it will be. That will be that element. But where you need to have the conversation is a different uh, uh, ground, which is the collaborative ground. And that whole idea of help me help you, like entering into that dynamic is the very enabler of the learning experience that needs to take place so that they can actually bend. It's so true because I can see that then it's not, not even the person's fault that look, they, they are in an agenda. They do have priorities. So it can easily end up as the scapegoat. And once yep. you are the scapegoat, they're emotionally invested in that narrative because it offers a solution to whatever they're seeking. Now to get out of that place, what well, that's exactly the right way of like, no, we need to start collaborating on this. And, there is a toolkit, apparently, that just allows you to get on that track, you know, through the right questions. So I love this so much. I also have some questions around, for example, you mentioned multiple times of getting things in writing. Yeah. I feel like that there's something to talk about that because I think it's so important. So maybe in the next recap, I will dig into that a little bit. And the consultative posture will also be the perfect segue into the discovery. I think so too. And just on that note about getting in mm -hmm. writing, we do have on our roadmap, a future episode where we talk about tactics oh, yeah. in the meeting. That's yep. the one. That that's where oh, it's gonna fit go. perfectly. Oh, fantastic! Okay, yeah. love it, sir. Look, and we're landing the plane right on the dot. It's uh, four p.m. in uh, on in Boston, and it's one p.m. here in Vancouver. So it's always a pleasure, inc yes, increasingly so. And uh, I can't wait for the next episode. Me too, man. All right. Have a Take good care. one. Bye-bye.